Good afternoon, good evening, hello. I'm Hanya Salah, Deputy Director at the Columbia Global Center in Amman. Thank you for joining us today for the first in a series of conversations and workshops on Kalila wa Dimna, a book of wisdom in fable form that is central to both Arabic and world literature. Today's conversation and following workshops are part of the Anonym Classic Project at the Free University of Berlin. The project is led by Dr. Beer Beatrice Grundler and includes scholars from around the world that are working on a digital synoptic edition of Kalila Wadimna based on the study of over a hundred manuscripts. This initiative sponsored by the European Research Council is the first ever comprehensive study of Kalila Wadimna. A workshop in relation to the project was to take place in Berlin this summer, which had to be canceled due to COVID-19. Matthew Keegan, a member of the Anonym Classic team, as well as a member of our center's faculty advisory committee, approached us with the idea of hosting a remote academic workshop through Columbia University's Global Center in Amman. We were delighted to be involved and to have the opportunity to share this classic work with a broader audience and to raise awareness of this remarkable scholarly initiative. The Anonym Classic Team's commitment to promote the understanding of global cultures through the in-depth study and dissemination of a classic text is very much in line with the mission of Columbia's global centers. The global centers are hubs of the university, currently in nine cities around the world, that work with students, faculty, and partners to create opportunities for shared, for shared learning and research, and to deepen the nature of global dialogue on a range of issues. I would now like to hand over to Professor Matthew Keegan, who will serve as a moderator for this conversation. Matthew Keegan is the Moniyan Assistant Professor in Asian and Middle Eastern Cultures at Barnard College of Columbia University. His research focuses on the intersection of Arabic literature and Islamic thought in the pre-modern Arabic world. Before Barnard, he taught at the American University of Sharjah and was a postdoc in Berlin as part of the Kalila Wadimna project we are discussing today. Thank you again to everyone in our virtual audience for being with us, and please join me in welcoming Professor Matthew Keegan. Over to you. Thank you so much, Hania, and uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce and moderate these events. Over the course of the next few Mondays, we will be talking about Kalila Wadimna, which is a collection of stories featuring talking animals, and it is a classic of both Arabic literature and world literatures. I think it's therefore really appropriate that we should be discussing this in a global forum with scholars and audience members from all across the world. The text has traveled across languages and cultures and it has been transformed and adapted in all of those linguistic and cultural contexts. What's most fascinating about the text, for me anyhow, is that the versions of Kalila Wadimna that exist in Arabic are not really one version. In fact, it survives in hundreds of manuscripts all over the world, and there is an extremely high degree of variation between these different manuscript copies. Many copyists seem to have reinterpreted the text as they copied it, adding bits and reshaping the stories as they did. This situation is very different when you look at some of the other literary works from the pre-modern period. For example, the Muhammad's al Hariri, a text that I've worked on. Um, there you see manuscript copyists and collators comparing their new manuscript versions against older copies especially those belonging to the author. In other words, they're trying to sort of maintain an authorial original. Making a critical edition of that kind of text, that more stable kind of text, is certainly no easy task, as our panelists know. But the medieval copyists and collators certainly are helping you out. By contrast, Kalila Wadimna was, as one of our guests today has said, an unruly classic. And this has made producing a reliable edition of the text an impossible task for generations of scholars. So today we have a conversation between some eminent scholars of Arabic literature, all of whom have done work on editing Arabic texts from the basis of manuscripts. They will be talking about Khalil Wadimna, its history, its manuscripts, and excitingly, its illustrations. We have Beatrice Grundler, professor and chair of Arabic language and literature at the Free University of Berlin, 
formerly a professor of Near Eastern languages and cultures at Yale. She has published numerous books and articles on Arabic literature. She has also published an edition and translation of the life of Abu Tamim as part of the area of Arabic literature. Her newest book, Investigator, project funded by the USC, the European Research Council, and the project called Anonym Classic. It's made up of dozens of researchers, programmers, and scholars, and, uh, and they're working towards a synoptic edition of Khalil Wadimna. It also aims at better understanding its transmission across languages and cultures. Asking all the important questions today, we have Bilal Orfali from Beirut, where he is the Sheikh Zayed Chair of Arabic and the chair of that department at the University of Beirut. He previously held the a chair in Arabic study published on Arabic and Sufism, also the editor of numerous Arabic texts. And finally, we have Rima Rubin, a junior researcher with the Anonymous Project in Berlin, who has been for her master's thesis, been transcribing manuscripts with Dimna. Rima is international researchers who scholars and students from Egypt, Tunisia, Iraq, Syria, Spain, the United States, the, the Netherlands, and all over Germany. Rima is, in fact, the only member of the entire team born in Berlin itself. Let me just remind everyone, uh, today is just the keynote kickoff of a series of workshops that begin one week from today and continue every Monday in July. You can register for those events in a link provided in the chat box. Please use the, uh, the Q&A box to post your questions. Um, it's active now, so you can post questions as they occur to you. I will keep track of that box and feed the questions to our panelists after the keynote conversation. Um, we are also live tweeting our event uh, with the hashtag Digital Kalila. And now let me turn it over to Bilal Orfali. It's a pleasure to host uh, this panel. So the first question is to both of you. Kalila wa Dimna is a work of wisdom literature in the form of animal fables. What is the global significance of the work? Uh, Kalila wa Dimna is a work that has been translated into circa 40 languages worldwide. If Just imagine that. It's perhaps easier to explain that, that in Europe, now we talking about European languages, it is mm. easier to count those languages that have been not translated into. I mean, it's, forget English, French, and German, it's in Hungarian, in Icelandic, in Georgian, if that's part of Europe. So it's in a number of languages, and not only one time, but often several times, it has been 10 times translated into German and eight times into oh. French. Now that is Europe. Um, after that, uh, it, uh, of course, spread to Asia, Persia, we know several times in very creative ways. And in the um, 19th century, it sort of makes a circle. So it goes back where some of its pieces came from, and it's translated into South Asian languages, Hindi, Bengali, and all the way to Southeast Asia, Malay and uh, Madurese, Javanese, for instance. So if there is any work in world literature that is global, even before we knew what that was, it is Kalila Wadimna. So in addition, one of the unique or outstanding criteria of Kalila Wadimna as a book is its effortlessness in moving from one religion to the other, from Hinduism to Islam to Christianity, and thus gains global significance according to its content. So the question of morals and ethics, for example, generosity, friendship, piety, smart behavior, and how to deal with enemies, all of these characteristics are equally dealt with and can be adapted or transferred to each religion. And not only the religions, but to any kind of social issue in every corner of the world. So that's what led to the adoption in Europe by very well-known people like La Fontaine or Goethe, for example. Excellent, thank you. So we know that the text was shaped in many ways by Ibn al-Muqaffa, right? It can be traced, of course, to Indian origins, the Panchatantra, the Mahabharata, but it's effectively a work of multiple authorships, multiple hands, right? 
Can you tell us what is exactly the role of Abdel Mukaffa and, of course, the subsequent quote unquote authors or copyists in shaping the text? Maybe I can type in this. Ibn Mukaffa is sort of in the midstream, but let's not forget that he worked with Indian elements and right. uh, not, not whole works. You know, we have the, the Panchatantra and the entire Book of Wisdom, which is part of Kalila, and we have the Mahabharata, the, the, the great story, um, almost a national epic, of which pieces appear. But then somebody made a very smart selection that was in Persia before Islam and composed what is then the Kalila Wadimna. And mm. that was translated by Ibn Muqaffa. And uh... maybe I can add something to that. Um, yeah, regarding the role of Ibn Muqaffa, not only was he the one who translated the Middle Persian version into Arabic, or better, he claims that it was him. Mm. Uh, Ibn Muqaffa also added some very important chapters. Um, for example, the introduction of the book, Muqaddamat uh, Ibn Muqaffa, and the investigation of Dimna is also an addition of him to the book. So it became one of the very first books, Arabic books at all. So after the Quran and uh, Kitab Sib mm. of Sibawai, for example. I'll get back to this actually later, but can you tell us also about the role of the copyist, right? Because um, the Arabic version is not only one version, right? Gladly. Yeah, that mm. is, I mean, we know about Ibn Muqaffa, but we don't have his text, except mm. in little snippets that were uh, cited by uh, one, two or three hundred years after him. The, his text is lost. But then at the, in the third, 13th century, so half a millennium later, after this dark phase, we have a resurgence of massive amounts of manuscripts. And that keeps going until the 19th century. And by the earliest manuscripts, they are so diverse that there is no way to say which is closer. And wow. um, since you cannot tell, and believe, believe me, we try very hard to do that, but we also thought is we cannot turn back the wheel of history and we cannot be a, a historical. So what we're doing is we document what we find at the time without wanting to change it, but we want to understand what happened. And we do that by comparing them and actually seeing that the text provoked copyists to write back. And that's why <laughs> versions kept changing and in, in different ways, some a little, some a lot, but not even the same manuscript. Sometimes you read manuscripts and then it stays very close to the other one. You think, mm, this is boring. Boom, in the next chapter, something completely crazy happens. So you can feel almost how the copyists were reacting to this text. Fascinating. So the text also appeals to children and adults. I remember I read it when I was seven years old and I still read it now. It can be taught to a seven year old child and to a university student. Uh, so it instructs and entertains at the same time. Can you tell us uh, or explain to us these different layers of the text? So I may begin. Um, so in the, in the introduction of Ibn Bukhafa, four kinds of audiences are actually mentioned. Um, the first one is Kalila wa Dimna is, a, is in form of a fable story in order to attract youthful seekers of entertainment. And secondly, the representation of the figures of animals in a variety of colors is intended to delight the hearts of kings and uh, increase the desire for the book. And thirdly, it is intended to ensure that the book is acquired by kings and rulers and thus copied, thus benefiting mm. both artists and copyists so that everyone gets something out of it. And um, the fourth concerns the philosopher specif specifically. So all of that is mentioned in the intro of Ibn Muqaffa, so to speak of its suitable content for all ages, as it is still today taught, um, as you've already mentioned, in school mm. and college. So. Mm -hmm. So that's what Ibn Muqaffa, or probably um, the copyist, uh, the, uh, the earliest uh, version of, of the statement is from the 13th century, and it's in, not in all the manuscripts. However, nonetheless, uh, what, do, what does the real reception of the book say? 
And the reception says, yes, on the one hand, it does function like a children's book with probably drastically rewritten versions. But you can also very easily teach at the university. I do that regularly. And uh, the first time I did it, I was surprised at how the students found the human questions in there intriguing. For instance, what is friendship? What is uh, true versus um, uh, calculated a friendship? What is betrayal? Um, how does one conduct oneself in life? And once you have worked yourself through the, the FUSHA, um, there is a lot of material that, um, that university students find either controversial or interesting and it, a whole discussion ensues. And then, of course, we as, uh, as researchers are intrigued by this entire process of the history of this book. It's so complicated. It's uh, endlessly exciting. So in a way, you know, thinking about the question when, um, you know, we discussed what uh, Ibn Muqaffa foretold in his preface about the kinds of audiences has actually proven true. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, um, Rima, the question is to you. Uh, I know you work on the illustrations of the text and they, they seem to form an integral part of the transmission of the text. Can you tell us more about these translation, uh, these illustrations? So we don't have many Arabic books uh, to start with um, or genres that uh, were meant to be illustrated. So aside from the famous Maqamat al-Hariri, which is the most illustrated manuscript uh, followed by Kalila Wudimna, we have a few other works, for example, Kitab al-Aghani by Abu al-Farraj al-Isfahani. So the far prime of illustrations in Arabic literature was in the 13th century, but we have a few earlier illustrated manuscripts of the 10th to the 12th century, for example. So yes, the presence of illustrations is indeed uh, very special and needs more attention in various perspectives. So um, yeah, in order to answer that question of the importance of illustrations in Kayla Wudimna, fairly, I will show a few examples. I will share my screen now. So, so as I've already said, um, they are uh, indeed very important the illustrations to, the, to, a, to do a detailed analysis of manuscripts. Um, illustrations need to be considered next to the text as an essential element. And that cannot be realized without uh, taking account of the text, uh, the images, the legends that link them, and importantly, the relationship between all of these elements. By the way, um, to start with, uh, this is a beautiful image that shows uh, the Iranian uh, physician delivering the book. Um, yeah, so here you can see the famous image of the oldest illustrated Kali Arabic Kalila Wudimna manuscript. It's dated to the early 13th century, and those are the two protagonists, uh, the two jackals, Kalila and Dimna. This is uh, actually a very famous, one of the most famous uh, images in Kalila Wudimna manuscripts. So we mentioned the preface before. From the preface of Ibn Mukhaffa, it is clear that manuscripts of Kalila Wudimna were intended to be illustrated. So one passage in the Muqaddimah of Ibn Mukhaffa gives us some information on this issue, although this passage isn't present in all Arabic text versions. Um, quote, it, it says, it was intended to show images of the animals in varieties of paints and colors so as to delight the hearts of princes and also the degree of care which they would bestow on the work. Arabic, So it occurs in one of the earliest um, manuscripts, as I've already mentioned. So for the most part, uh, the legend provides the reader not merely with the name of the illustrated character, but also with a short description of a particular point of the plot. It also provides uh, information by linking the image uh, to the text. So uh, there are four varieties in which the way the illustration can occur. While some Arabic manuscripts contain illustrations with captions, as you can see in this particular um, example, in other cases, illustrations don't have legends or captions at all. You just have the image without a caption, as for example, in this 
case. So in some, in some other cases, um, manuscripts lack the illustrations, but have empty spaces reserved for them with legends that describe the content. So here in red ink, uh, you can find the legend without an image with a big space. So you know there should have been an illustration, but it isn't. So the last variety are captions noted within a frame in the text or in the margins with no place left for the illustration for themselves at all. Where in this case, uh, in the Berliner Wettstein manuscript, the legends are written in the margin. So um, it highlights specific, specific scenes or uh, it highlights specific content. If you go over through the manuscript, you know, you know exactly where you are by reading, just by reading the, the a legend. So this is an illustration of a manuscript, Chilla, 15th century, of the chapter Ilad wa Bilad, or the king and his eight, eight dreams. And here you can see that the king is dying. It is no doubt that it's a very beautiful ornamented illustration. And the second image shows the king again lying. And this time you can see a few creatures floating above him. If you have a look at the legend that says, um, that this is, image is of the king and his dream, the legend tells us exactly that this is a vision of the king, of the sleeping king. Um, and uh, about the content, only by reading the legend. So the third example is uh, extraordinary. Here, the king is drawn sleeping and above him, you can see again what is usually invisible, namely his dreams. He dreams of snakes, fish, birds. Um, yeah, the illustrator uses another dimension by drawing floating animals above the sleeping king. So the first example is the only version that does not have the animals floating above the king. And this is actually a rather unusual image in the Arabic manuscripts. Now, by only looking at the illustrations, one can assume a relation between some manuscripts, since the motifs do appear in the exact same execution as in other manuscripts. Just to give you an impression how illustration can variate in style and motif. In this case, the elements are similar, but in style different. So nevertheless, uh, this does not mean that this particular image occurs in each illustrated manuscript. It does not. It's rather a rare uh, motif or illustration. So in the chapter Life of Borzoi, the Iranian physician, which is placed before the book proper and is thought to have been written by Borzoi, in this chapter at the very end, Borzoi writes that but weakness in humans is allegorized by the man who falls into a well or deep pit while fleeing from a wild elephant. He steps on two snakes while hovering over the pit and then holds into the withered branches signaled by rats and at the bottom of the well is a dragon with an open mouth ready to devour him. The man reaches for the honey in a beehive and in one of the trees and tries some of it. He totally forgets about his dangerous situation that his feet were resting on the heads of the snakes and or that he, the rats are nibble, nibbling the branches and then he loses his foothold and falls to his death. This illustration is a good example to show how images in Arabic Kalila Wudimna manuscripts function. Firstly, it is one of the popular stories, so it is often found in illustrated manuscripts. The second point is a very, it is a very dramatical scene in life by every detail as the rats, uh, snakes upon which the man's feet rest and dragon at the bottom of the well. So the text may describe the situation, but the illustration makes this situation more dramatic. Just by looking at the re at it, the reader will exactly know what is happening, what's going on. In this case, we have an image that tells us a story by itself. So here is an example of the same illustration in different styles and executions. This, this we term the image cycle. It is one of the first, uh, it is on the first glance obvious that this is the same motif. You can find small differences regarding details such, such as the well and uh, the way it is drawn. So the Rabat uh, manuscript, this manuscript is the only example where you really can see that this is actually a deep well. The second example is uh, Parker, obviously, one cannot speak of a deep well here in this case. So 
The third example is the only one including a beehive, which is mentioned in all the, of the text, but left out in most of the illustrations. So the fourth example shows uh, the Karakis style of drawing, referring to the Turkish shadow puppet character, very simplified and in floating style, and the image that I've already uh, shown before to have a comparison. comparison. So, yeah, we have nearly 100 manuscripts so far, which is a huge number. If you consider the detailed work on each manuscript, so illustration are an essential element, as I've already said. Um, we look at, at a lot of important aspects, for example, the images. So out of the 100 manuscripts, about 40 manuscripts contain images or blanks. This is a huge number. And that may be considered as spaces or should have been filled with illustrations. Most of the illustrations have also a legend. So this table shows on the left side the names of the manuscripts and on the top the names we have labeled each motif. The green boxes represent images that shows how different the place or the amount of uh, images in each manuscript can be. Each manuscript is very unique. Even if the text is copied, they still can be very different from each other. So that was everything from my side. Thanks for listening and uh, please feel free to ask any question. Thank you, thank you, Rima. Beatrice, I, I would like to go back to you. So what is the status of Kalila Wadimna today in Arabic literature? When did, when did it become a classic? Can you turn on just the microphone? Yeah, very good. It helps. You don't have to read my thoughts. Uh, we all mm -hmm. think we know what a classic is, but each person has uh, his or her own concept of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, some classics of world literature uh, are actually, in the beginning, quite untypical books. If you think of Hamlet's um, Shakespeare's Hamlet, who is not very much hero-like. Um, and Kalila Wadimna is, with an Arabic literature, a rather unusual text. How many fable collections do we have? But uh, coming back to the reception, it was a classic um, for different people at different times. i give you mm. some examples. So in the beginning, at the time of Ibn Muqaffa, the, uh, the prose writers found it to be a model of fluid Arabic prose, and uh, we know that because in, in the early book catalog of the 10th century, it is mentioned as one of the a couple of books that every secretary tried to imitate. And even later on in the 10th and 11th century, things are quoted. And there are even complaints that uh, people read too much Kalila Wadimna and too little Quran. So on the educated people, it was very popular. Now, you move half a millennium forward to the 13th century, by then the full texts appear and then the audience again is very rich. On the one hand, you have very ex um, laboriously made copies with fancy images, must have been very expensive, the ones like Anima Redwan has shown us from the 14th century. So these were certainly made for elite individuals. On the other hand, uh, as centuries pass, we have very simple copies without images or even spaces for images, copied sometimes carelessly, sometimes creatively, and you can tell that the work has become, has developed an appeal to the upper middle classes. At the same time, in the 8th century, we have a rise of authorship. So, so people also start to write their own diaries, and those same people read Kalila Wadimna, and some of our copies were from lending libraries. So the people didn't even have to buy it. And today, again, its audience has changed. And I should mention the European audience, while it had become more of an upper middle class book, uh, yeah, let's say from the 16th and 17th century onwards, when it was translated into European languages, it was done for princes. For mm -hmm. in Castile, Spain, uh, even Persian, or even in Germany, it was uh, translated to a German duke in the 15th century. And there it was considered very valuable uh, exotic knowledge one was importing. Very nice. So how do the stories hang together, right? There is a flame story and 
the framing system is quite complicated, right? And not, not uncommon in Arabic literature, of course. But how do the stories hang together in the book? Yeah, you're quite right to say that because everybody will immediately think of the Arabian Nights that has the frame that Tahrazat is telling stories that she keeps interrupting at suspenseful moments. So she has to remain alive. And that is known as a time gaining frame. Now, the frame in Kalila Wadimna is not a time gaining frame. There, there are many different kinds of frames, mm. you know, from the Decameron, for instance, which is another time gaining frame. In Khalila Wadimna, we have a philosopher and a king, and the king is a reformed tyrant who wants to learn how to be a good king and asks the philosopher a question, and to each question the answer is a parable. That is the outer frame. Then, which in this parable, the characters tend to tell each other tales. And uh, those characters tell each other tales who tell each other tales. Sometimes mm -hmm. we have five um, concentric frames of telling. And you think one might get confused, but one does not. Because the way the telling is done, and I would say that is particular to Kalila, there's always a reason. A character tells another character a reason as an argument. So don't be as stupid as, and then comes the story. And then usually other person asks, as whom, explain that. And then the story comes. And then at the end, the person telling or the animal telling the story, uh, I have told you the story in order that you do not behave stupidly. And then the other person, well, we don't know the reaction. It can go both ways. Uh, the, the listener can listen or he can do the opposite. We have examples of both. But the stories are each time brought back into the context of the frame and then brought back in the upper context so the listener or reader does not uh, get lost. And um, the other effect of this kind of um, uh, modular system is that allows you to keep the framework as a whole and exchange the pieces so you can put in, in the Persian version, you put in a lot of Persian mm -hmm. verses or Quran or Hadith. In the Syriac version, you have Christian parables. And the text remains the same. It doesn't lose its identity, but allows a maximum of internal adaptation. Very nice. So, Kalila Wadimna, as you mentioned, is also one of the first books to appear in Arabic, right? Uh, right after the Quran. Uh, your forthcoming book, Beatrice, from Harvard University Press, uh, deals with this early Arabic book culture. What are some of the features of Kalila Wadimna as a book? Yeah, they, as a side, we do have an, um, an Arabic book revolution, you can say, uh, veritably, in the ninth century. But Kalila Wadimna even antedates that. It's a book mm. in the eighth century when there were not so many books around yet. And um, it came with, you know, when we think of book, we think uh, preface, table of contents, um, index. So it didn't have an index. Books didn't have indices in these days, but it certainly had a preface. And um, as such, it was already a very modern, reducted book. But people's concept of a book was yet quite different. You have books like the Majalis Sa'lab, for instance, that were simple transcripts without any order. And the physical book was one thing, but the books could be very well in people's heads. Uh, so a book, especially a scholarly book, would come with a person who was able to read and teach it to keep it text stable. Like, like Matt Tegan told us in the beginning, the Makamat is mm. kept stable. And in order to keep a book stable, you need to pay attention and have a, a specialist in control with Kalida and Dimna, that was not the case. This book fell out of control and then had the freedom to develop by the people who um, transmitted it in writing. And uh, so in a way, while its structure is so amazingly perfect, it also falls apart into its pieces because this, the pieces are appealing. And some anthologists just pick the pieces. So it has, has a double life in pieces and as a whole. And then I would maybe also conclude that um, it thinks a lot about itself. The preface explains that 
uh, knowledge is one thing and reading a book we should tell that uh, you know to our students who uh, have to do a lot of reading in the internet reading a book requires you to critically judge the contents and choose what is persuasive and what not and check your facts and then when you've done that step two is you have to do what you've learned so the one thing is critical thinking when reading and then applying your thoughts in uh, in real life and one of the mixes between ethics and practical intelligence there uh, one recurring theme is to think about the consequences of one's action and that is something we can very well apply to our lives currently because right now every individual you know in these crazy times of corona why we're not sitting together is how i act can affect you know many many other people and i should think carefully about that uh, so in that way and in other ways i think Kalila wadimna is still quite a timeless book with this positive note about timelessness uh, thank you beatrice grundler thank you rima Rudwan, for this uh, interesting conversation and i hand in the floor to matt matt please go ahead Thank you so much for uh, for that very interesting keynote conversation. I think this gives us a great place to start from for this month-long event uh, or series of events about Kalila Wadimna. Um, those of you who are, who are paying full attention to what was going on, you may have questions in your mind, so I'm keeping an eye on the chat box but um, or the Q&A box, so please do send in your questions. I'll try to get to as many as I can. Um, the first question I wanted to ask was a question from uh, Carl Davila, who asked about the, the issue of orality. Uh, is it, you know, to what extent does orality play a role in the transmission of Kalila Wadimna in the differing versions and retellings of Kalila Wadimna? Um, I, I think this is a really interesting uh, issue to address, uh, uh, if you, if you would, would respond to that. Thanks. Uh, this is a, a totally relevant question and a question that concerned me in the beginning too. Because when I first started to look at different versions, I assumed, you know, there's some oral retelling going on, having, you know, before looked at uh, the uh, Thousand and One Nights. But what puzzled me is when you compared manuscripts, there were completely rewritten sentences or pieces of sentences, when there were sentences that were verbatim the same. So it kept alternating between verbatim and non-verbatim. And I didn't understand in the beginning what was going on till I understood it was written rewriting. And there are many different uh, arguments um, since that we now know the manuscripts, um, that the variety is, is really written creation. So it's not oral storytelling, which we also have in Arabic literature, and it's, it's exciting, but this is really a case of, of, of mouvance par écrit, as I call it, as a written rewriting. But having said that, now, since we have um, more people on the team and some of us have uh, traveled in the Middle East, we have now also heard from the grandfathers of some people on the team that they told orally some of the sub-stories. And then now we can make sense, there are some manuscripts they have selections of only the sub-stories of the interior tales about some animals that were shorter. And I now think that they were made for oral retelling. So yes, there is a parallel oral life in the later literature, a later life of Kalila Wadim as well. That's, that's really great. And I, I wanted to follow up with this uh, with another question from uh, Christine von Reuenbecker. Um, which is about the human stories in the in, in Kalida Wadimna, because it's so often uh, described and, and thought of as a collection of uh, stories about talking animals. Um, but of course, there are uh, so many stories with just human actors. You know, we saw the, the king dreaming and all of these other things. So what is the role of these human stories, how do they differ from the animal stories, and, and why do we think of this text all the time as a, as a book about talking animals um, when there are so many uh, key human characters in it? This is actually uh, quite true. I think um, some of us still have a bit of a European perspective, 
So we have to call this book something, so we call it fables. But the Arabic word is not fables. The Arabic word is masal, and that means parable. Um, and we use the word parable for Christian legends, and they are with, and with uh, humans. But the essence of, of the amsal of Kalila Wadimna is the analogy. Yeah, and the preface even explains that as as a muqaddimat and nata'ij. You have to decode them analogically. And absolutely, there are humans and animals, and they are clearly intermixed. One story, the Rima showed us the story of the king and his dreams. It's about a not-so-wise king and a wise wife who escapes from being executed rashly. The king actually wants her executed, but the vizier steps in and teaches the king a lesson, and she survives in the end. But as interesting is the chapter of the owls and the crows, and that is an interloping um, spy of, um, of the crows um, going to the owls and pretending to be um, 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 uh, a fugitive. And the stories to warn, he's not believed by all, and the stories to warn them are then taken from humans, namely from marital betrayal. And these are very graphic stories, and they're also illustrated. So I think the intercalation between humans and animals is constant and uh, permanent. And even if he has animals, they totally behave like humans. And if Ibn Abdi Rabbih in his unique necklace quotes the ravens or the hares or the jackals, he just does not mention this as a jackal. He just said, one wise counselor said, and then we go. That's fantastic. And I, I, I love that, that aspect of the text of animals acting exactly like humans and humans ex acting exactly like animals. Um, there, uh, there have been a few questions about this fascinating issue of different versions and manuscripts uh, testifying to various reactions of individual commentary, common, uh, uh, copyists. So, uh, so Sarah Farcelli has asked, can you expand on um, what it means that, uh, you know, this, this is an, that this reflects different reader reactions? Um, what kinds of reactions do you see when a copyist uh, changes a text in some way? Uh, how, how can you um, identify those, those, those reactions through those rewritings? Mm -hmm. to, you have to be very careful when you do that, and uh, you have to know a lot of manuscripts. And then when you have one manuscript, uh, I, I sort of found out that some work like Continua, so they, they, they're close to each other and each is a little bit different from another one. So if you have one and the two closest, then you can immediately see the passages that are unique. And I've done that once with the chapter of Cat and Rat and added up all the small uh, additions and cuts and changes. And uh, the character of the rat uh, appears in in different ways in um, in one uh, version that is in Paris 466 the um, the copyist was interested in the legal part in the contract in the obligations and in the rights and in holding each other true to the mutual duties so the the rat is the one the stronger character is mentioning these aspects and the added pages are all about duties and tasks and responsibilities. And then another manuscript, um, this is London 4044, has probably the most uh, unique added features. And that even goes in two dimensions. On the one hand, fate is, is an important element that, that gets added in. It's not there. He adds it in. And uh, then there is the struggle between hum human, I say human nature, but it's actually animal nature. We have a friendship between a cat and a rat. They conclude that uh, strategically. So they go against their nature. Because, so fate forces them to go against their nature. And that becomes sort of the greater battle. Uh, so you can see the copyists being interested either in, in that co collision between fate and, and, and nature or between what is right and wrong in ethics. And, uh, I think that's so fascinating, this, this idea of adding in the question of fate or overlaying a kind of philosophical question 
through copying. Um, and I, and I, some people have asked about, you know, where they, where they can find information about this. And I would invite them to come to the, uh, the workshops because we'll, we'll be digging into the details uh, in, 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 in a bit more of the nitty gritty of, you know, what, what these things look like when you look at them close up between different versions. Um, but on that point of, of engaging with the text or readers engaging with the text, many people have asked about Rima's presentation uh, about the illustrations and especially um, do the illustrations sort of interact with the text? Do they, do they write back to the text in any way? Do they, do they react to the text and, and interpret the text or are they sort of uh, more standardized in some way? Uh, can, you, can you see the illustrator's uh, process of interpreting and reading the text when you, when you see a, a particular set of illustrations? So thank you for this question. It's a great question. Uh, first of all, I think um, there has been uh, like models of illustrations that often occur in each manuscript, but in, dif but in different styles. So sometimes the uh, illustrator adds a few, a small detail, but most of the times it's actually copied of the, the motif as a motif as its own is copied from another manuscript, but in different style, most of the cases. But we have, we do have um, some unique illustrations that may have been added by the illustrator himself who chose to uh, draw or, or illustrate that picture. So it depends, but most of the times there are models and they um, keep the motives at, as they are, but add a few details, as I've already said, in different styles. So. Wonderful. Um, there have been a few questions about uh, available versions of Kalila Wadimna. Um, so there have been, there's been a question about, are there versifications of Kalila Wadimna? And there have been questions about what English versions are there out there that I can, uh, that I can read. And I think that, you know, for this, for this kind of keynote uh, uh, audience, I think that this is really important to, um, to bring up because you know, if you're interested in Kalila Wadimna, if you want to sit down and read some Kalila Wadimna and then watch some workshops after this, you might want to actually have some engagement with the text. So can you recommend a, uh, a version of Kalila Wadimna? Um, yes, well, it's not an easy answer. And the, the reason I started on this project is actually I wanted, I have a course called Classics of Arabic Literature, and I wanted to teach Kalila Wadimna. And I was looking for a text and I found there was no critical edition. And I thought, this is unacceptable. Um, a classic that is not edited. Now, so I went about to edit one, and then I understood why there was no edition. Um, we are trying now to do an, um, an edition in which different versions of it that we still have to pick will appear simultaneously because we cannot sort of um, falsify the face of history. The text is a rich text with many varieties. This being said, in the interim, uh, there is a translation produced only from one manuscript by Michael Fischbein for the Library of Arabic Literature. And he's taken the manuscript I just talked about, a London 4044, which is a peculiar one, but a, in a very intelligent reinterpretation. And that, will, that entire manuscript will be available in an edition and a translation. And uh, we are planning on making a pilot edition of a selected, uh, of six selected manuscripts of one chapter, The Rat and the Cat, the chapter I told about. And we hope to have that up in our project site in the second half of this year, when you can enjoy and sort of double check for yourself the different varieties of this chapter. So that, that, ad, that translation for the Library of Arabic Literature is not published yet, correct? It is not published yet. It's in the making. We've it's, sort of collaborated a bit. The, um, I, I have to say, and it's embarrassing for me to say that, but that's why we are working very hard on solving this problem. There is not a good English translation at the moment. There is a translation of one manuscript, uh, the oldest dated manuscript, um, by André Miquel, and that is a, trans, a French translation. Um, I can recommend that because that is true to one manuscript. The, um, 
all older translations are uh, unhistoric the combinations of different manuscripts which don't really tell you and it would not be a right thing to read them now because they don't do the work justice. Yeah, I, I have taught based on the, um, the new Wheeler Thaxton translation, which is a translation of the Persian translation mm -hmm. of the Arabic translation of the Persian. I mean, it, so it, and, it, and it works very well for the classroom, but, but it's very difficult to get a, a grasp on precisely the kinds of text that you are working on. Um, if you want a, an English translation, but the Wheeler Thaxton at least is, is sort of a, um, a, a more modern uh, English translation than some of the earlier uh, versions. Um, there have been a, a, a several questions uh, that we're asking you to dig a little bit deeper into the relationship between uh, Kalila Wadimna and uh, the Panchatantra and the Mahabharata, because that, 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 that has fascinated some of the people here. You know, what is precisely this relationship between Kalila Adimna and its sort of Sanskrit uh, backstory? Mm -hmm. the, uh, the Panchatantra is um, more, it's the larger share. Uh, that makes up uh, Kalila Wodimna, and it means the five occasions of good sense, and that is a, a book of political strategy. And that gets um, larger pieces of that are translated and become part of the Kalila Wodimna. And, uh, and that, is, that has been studied in depth by people like Hertel, and that has been known for a long time. The part of the Mahabharata, which is a huge epic, and it's, it's one of the uh, sort of most difficult to understand Indian text. And of that, only a small piece gets reused, and that is um, uh, Dishanti Parvan, which is the, actually the middle piece between the battles. So it's um, the part of the, of the Mahabharata that has wisdom sayings, and of that, only three small chapters are reused. And we had a wonderful experiment with uh, our Sanskrit um, collaborating scholar Florinda Di Simini because we could read the, San, the, the Mahabharata version next to the Syriac version, which is older than the Arabic, and then the Arabic version. And we could sort of see what the changes were made. So the end of, uh, for instance, the Lion and the Jackal chapter, uh, which is uh, irre irreconcilable um, um, enmity in the end in, in the Mahabharata text, but in because it's only about ethics and beliefs in the Kalila Wadimna, uh, the king can reconcile the courtier who he mistreated and they become fast friends. Uh, so, so you can see the, the changing of what has happened. So as important as the origin, you want to see what did the, the, the Arabic redactor change in order for him to be able to say what he wanted to say? Yes, I think this is one of the great things about this project, which has you know, a dozen over a dozen scholars working on, uh, in, in Berlin, but also lots of other scholars from elsewhere working on different versions, working on uh, the, the Sanskrit version, working on the uh, Hebrew version. And, and being able to bring all of these people together has been a real, uh, a real interesting aspect of this process. Um, one thing that uh, has also come up in several questions, uh, and, and the Q&A box is really full of great material right now, um, and, and we won't be able to get to all of it, but there, there have been several questions about the relationship between Kalilu Adimna and some of the other works of Adab that deal with animals. Um, things like Tabul Haywan or um, the, uh, the, the Book of Animals by Al Jahid or um, the, uh, the Epistles of the Brethren of Purity, um, the, um, the Ikhwana Safa. So, how does Khalilu Adzimna relate to, how do we situate Khalilu Adzimna within Adab? How does it relate to other texts of Adab? Um, uh, that, that, that I think has, has sort of puzzled some of our readers and it puzzles me as well. So. Uh, this is a puzzling question, but it's also one that, that has many facets. Um, since there are not a ton of books that are exactly like Kalila, it has uh, aspects that attach itself to different types of books that deal with animals. Let me start with the Ehwan Safa. Now, the Ehwan is um, is in, in many ways similar to Kalila in that it sort of falls between high and low literature in, in the late in the reception history. 
it it has a uh, a core of wisdom. It it is more uh, it's more agnostic and more philosophical than than Kalila, but it has this double nature of of a serious book that is told via animal allegories. But uh, it is more uniform in its message, and uh, it is sort of less um, entertaining, and it it doesn't have the sort of um, um, happiness and also the tongue in cheek uh, that that Kalila has. Uh, Kalila has some rather graphic subtitles, and the Juan doesn't do. But they they move in a similar way, and what. I found very fascinating that the Ikhwan also changes the manuscripts. Uh, there are many different um, aspects. It's sort of by theme, you know, there's one on mathematics and one on astrology and so on and so forth. But different chapters also change quite a bit. And on the Ikhwan is far, the last verdict has not been spoken. And I think now we have accepted, Kalila changes drastically. Now we should look again at the Ikhwan is far and, and do maybe a similar thing. Uh, Hayawan, well, uh, there are books on Arabic zoology is an early and, and uh, well-developed discipline. And uh, of course, uh, al Jahis quotes from uh, Kalila Wadimna here and there, not too much, but he's aware of it and uses it because obviously, well, he's not a strict zoologian, he's a literature talking about animals. So he would pick and choose from Kalila. But the practical view is that uh, copyists or patrons who liked Kalila obviously were interested in animals. So we have, for instance, a, a multi-text manuscript that begins with Damira, uh, Damiri's Kitab al-Hayawan al-Kubra, and then it continues with Kalila Wadimna. So the, uh, it was obviously seen in the larger context of animal literature but it could connect to zoology as well as to uh, allegories about animals. That's really fascinating. And, and I, I think one of the other uh, issues here is the question of how did people uh, quote Khalilu Adimna outside of Khalilu Adimna? There have been some questions about preaching, for instance. Do we have examples of uh, preachers using the parables or using the exemplar that we find in Khalilu Adimna in their work? Or do we find, uh, you know, how do we find people quoting uh, the work of Khalilu Adimna? In what kinds of works do we find quotations from Khalilu Adimna? Uh, now for preaching, that is an interesting question. For uh, I so far have not encountered uh, quotations of it in the sermon. Doesn't mean it cannot exist because in some sources, as you know very well, uh, Kalila has been um, positioned as a bit of as a competitor. It's asatir as as a competitor to the to the Quran because the Quran is also a in some ways not a storytelling book, more a book that gives exempla and mawaif. But uh, the use of Kalila tends to be more in books of advice. Um, and that is it's, it's wisdom sayings that are part strategic and part ethical. And um, if you look at the chapters on governance, on siyasa, be that in uh, the um, al ikl Farid or by in the books by Ibn Qutayba, all the way to the later literature, you have tons and tons of quotations of Kalila Wadimna in books of advice and books of wisdom. That's fantastic. Um, I, I, I think we are running towards the end of our time at the moment. This has gone by very quickly. Um, but I would just like to uh, thank everyone, uh, thank the Columbia Global Center in Amman, thank the ERC and the Freie Universität in Berlin, and to thank all of our panelists, Bilal Orfali, Beatrice Grindler, uh, Rima Redwan, and uh, Hania for uh, helping us organize all of this. The entire staff at the Global Center has been really fantastic in putting this thing together and allowing us to really, uh, you know, enjoy some of the academic activities that we have been missing out on as, uh, as, as events have been canceled. Um, I just like to remind everybody that uh, there will be events coming up um, July 13th, July 20th, and July 27th. Um, there are links in the chat box. 
Um, and you should be able to find these on the uh, Columbia Global Center on Men website where you can register and uh, participate. And we'll have uh, the ability to participate and we'll have a, a slightly wider circle of um, participants on video um, engaging in uh, Q&A and discussion um, more in an academic workshop uh, format, which, which will allow us to sort of uh, engage with some of the really difficult and thorny questions surrounding uh, translation, adaptation, the variation between manuscripts, all of the kinds of issues that you've seen raised here um, will be raised again and in, um, in, in, in great detail in, in the workshop. So if you, if you find this interesting, if you've enjoyed some of this, uh, we, we, we welcome you back uh, to the events happening every Monday in July uh, from here on out. Uh, thank you. And I'll hand it over to Hania to, um, to close us out. Uh, thank you, Matt. And I just wanted to thank everybody and look forward uh, to, uh, to having everybody join us uh, next Monday. Thank you to all the panelists. It was a really uh, a wonderful uh, event. Thank you.